Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection, of course. Uh, today I would like to tell you about this theorem, which is surprisingly new. It's not really new, it's from the 1930s of the last century, but it's still surprisingly new uh, compared to its content. It's about graphs and groups. And I think why it is so new is that it's pretty surprising. I find graphs very natural. I've grown up with graphs. So it feels like they were around forever. But actually, graphs are a pretty new notion in mathematics. People played around with graphs for, for a long time. You've probably heard about the story with, with Euler and the Euler, Euler the circle in uh, Bridges of Königsberg, um, which is, of course, pretty old. But graph as a mathematical concept is fairly recent. So the 1930s, end, end, end of the 30s, see, or something like uh, 35 plus, is in some sense actually a very early result for graph theory. Graph theory really started in the 50s or 60s of the last century. Anyway, so the theorem I'm going to talk about is actually pretty nice, and it's called Fruchts theorem, named after a mathematician with exactly that name. Uh, so no misnomer today. Um, and let's have a look what it actually is. So it's the following question. So groups have been around for uh, ages, well, actually, also not so long. Let's say 160, 70 years ago, groups were introduced, something like that. It took a while until really mathematicians appreciated the notion of a group. But anyway, so it has been around uh, for ages already in the 30s, where this theorem is from. And the idea of the group is roughly the following. So a number is actually an abstract incarnation, an abstract uh, concept of a real world incarnation. So the number three has a real world incarnation as three apples. And the group is some abstract concept, S4 here, group, symmetric group is in four elements of, of the letters one, two, three, four, is an abstract realization of an explicit uh, real world incarnation. Um, in this case, it's a symmetry group of the tetrahedron. So S4 is a symmetry group of the tetrahedron, given by certain, as you can see here, rotations and reflections. Uh, but as usual, uh, kind of maybe not as usual, but uh, certainly they are not just three apples, they are also three pears or three bananas or whatever. So uh, apples are just one incarnation and similar here. And you can kind of ask for nice incarnations of a given group. So group formalized symmetries and uh, one group can have many, uh, let me call them real life uh, incarnations. And kind of the question you would like to address or it seems to be very natural to me is um, kind of what kind of dimension do you need to realize an object that has a symmetry of a given group? So here, for example, you kind of need dimension three because you would, or two depends a little bit how you count because you would like to see this. Let me, let me just say three because you would like to see this as embedded in R3. Um, or uh, if you just want to see it as an object itself, it's only two dimensional. It's a surface, so maybe R2 uh, or two-dimensional object or whatever. But certainly, it's not one-dimensional. And somehow, a good question is: Can you can you realize every group is a one-dimensional object? It seems to be. I don't know. Um, groups can get fairly complicated. Zero dimensions are not enough. I will come back to points in a second. So that's easy to see. Um, but one dimension is absolutely not clear. And fourth theorem answers this question positively. So actually one dimension is enough. Uh, so let's have, have a look of what you can do. What is a one dimensional object? A one dimensional object is a graph. That's where graphs come into. So in this talk, I'm assuming finiteness conditions everywhere. So ignore that, ignore infinite graphs, ignore infinite groups. Um, so a graph is just this collection of vertices and edges, which is very natural. So here is a graph, uh, here's another graph, and you can ask for the symmetry group of the graph. It's just all permutations of the vertices which keep the, the edges. Uh, so graph automorphisms is just per permutation of the vertices that keep ed edge connections, right? A symmetry of a graph, that's exactly what it would be. Um, it doesn't really matter whether it's embedded or not. I just embed them by drawing them or put them in R2, but they don't even need to be embedded. But actually, I, we should like to think of them as an abstract object just given by vertices and edges. And this automorphisms, automorphisms of any kind of object always form a group. And this is a graph symmetry group. So the symmetry group of this graph here is S4, the symmetry group um, uh, of, uh, well, uh, the set one to four. And here it's S3, so let me explain. So one to four, if you just label the vertices, one, two, three, this is supposed to be a three, four, then you can just permute um, all of them. 
and you always keep kind of the, the edge connectivity because this graph is just super symmetric. Uh, as you can see, it's super symmetric. It has a huge symmetry group uh, here. Everything has three outgoing vertices and goes to everything. So this condition is always satisfied. So this is really, um, has really automorphism group S4. With contrast, if you remove certain edges, so this is only automorphism group S3 because you just can't permute this vertex. You can't send it to anything else. Well, as you can see, um, how can you? Because this has three outgoing edges and everything else has just one. So the only thing you can do is you can permute the, the four, in, uh, well, uh, leaves of the star. It's called the star. <laughs> and as you can see, then you can just permute them arbitrarily because they are completely symmetric. That's the whole point. Uh, so the symmetry group is S3 in this case. And kind of the question you would like to ask, we'll see that in a second, is for a given symmetry, for a given group, can you actually find a graph realizing that symmetry? And it isn't all that obvious. Uh, so yeah, a few more examples. So most graphs are actually completely asymmetric. So this one is a fun example. It's called Frucht graph, like uh, <laughs> the theorem, Frucht theorem. Um, it's, a, it's a graph which is not obviously asymmetric. So you need to stay on it a little bit to really, um, well, you can't really see it from the picture that it's asymmetric because it just might be illustrated in a bad way. And you can't play an easy game like different order of degrees of vertices because every vertex here is degree three, but you can't still can't permute any vertices. Um, kind of a homework exercise if you want. Uh, so the symmetry group of this beast is actually one. Uh, the symmetry group of this beast here is D4, dihedral group in order four. Uh, basically what you can do is you can already see it. You can reflect this picture and you can rotate this space so of the reflection action and you can rotate this picture and the middle vertex always stays fixed. So this symmetry group here is D4. So graphs can have really, really very different symmetry groups. And it's not always easy to tell um, just by staring at a graph what the symmetry group is. So here, as I said, it's not, not really obvious. It kind of, I don't know. Um, it's, it's not obvious, but it's kind of believable that this guy has no symmetries. Um, anyway, um, so this is usually a hard problem. And the question, addressed is, can you realize a group with one, dim with a one dimensional geometric object that has a group as a symmetry group? In other words, can you find a graph associated to a group such that the symmetry group of the graph is G? And the answer to this question is given by Frucht theorem. And yes, it's true in general. It's really cool result actually. It's, it's true in general, and you can find many, many more stronger versions of the same theorem. Uh, for example, you can kind of stick to simple graphs or whatever. There are infinite versions. Um, and a lot of facts are actually nowadays known about those graphs. And it's a non trivial fact. So here is <laughs> the number of graphs which are asymmetric, like, like this one here, is asymmetric. It has quite a few vertices, as you can see. And if you list the number of graphs that are asymmetric, uh, well, certainly a point is asymmetric. OK, fine. <laughs> so the symmetry group of a point is just well, <laughs> it's just a trivial group. But then you need to go to six vertices to see the first asymmetric graphs, and you have eight of them, and they're just listed here. So if you stay on them, you kind of can see that they are asymmetric. For example, this one here, if you would like to reflect this one here, it almost looks like you can reflect, but then this edge somehow breaks the symmetry, so you actually can't reflect. Anyway, so you need kind of fun exercise again. You need at least six vertices to find an asymmetric graph ignoring the trivial graph. Let me tell you uh, about the point graphs as well, the zero dimensional object. So just a graph without vertices because it has no vertices. Uh, the corresponding symmetry group is always SN to so just permute the vertices. Um, so really you need dimension one to realize all graphs. Dimension zero is not enough because you always end up just, well, SN is the group of permutations. So you always end up with the group of permutations as a symmetry group. As soon as you add in edges, you can actually realize absolutely every group. Although the problem is really non-trivial. So this very complicated looking graph, it's actually relatively complicated already. Um, it has 16 vertices and it's, it's the smallest graph that realizes um, the quaternionic group with eight elements. And it's kind of a little bit fun because you will find kind of wrong statements um, online sometimes. I, I can't even blame anyone here. Uh, so I'm not pointing fingers. It's, it's, it's really not easy sometimes to tell uh, whether a given graph is, has a certain group as a, as a symmetry. 
and to find the minimal one is also not easy. But there's a statement you can do. You can say that the minimal one has at most two times order of G vertices. So um, that this has 16 is really kind of the 16 vertices and the group is of order eight. It's really the extreme case. Um, anyway, um, but it's really not easy in general. So for example, the gra graph automorphism problem is not really known to have any nice complexity clauses. It probably is NP complete, but you, we really don't know. Most graphs actually have trivial automorphisms. So most graphs don't have enough symmetries and it's tricky to decide. As I said, uh, for the quaternionic group, if you Google um, graph symmetry quaternionic group, you will find contradicting results. So it's really not, and again, I don't want to point fingers. It's just, it's just a not very easy problem. And that's why I like first theorem because um, it's actually effective. I don't have time in this video to show you the construction, but you can find it in the links in the description. So it constructs a graph for a given group for you. Uh, which is too big in the sense that it has more than two G vertices, but it's still constructive, so it constructs a graph as a group and symmetry group. Okay, so why do I like fourth theorem so much? Well, it is an actually a nice question, right? So what is kind of the smallest dimension you need to realize a, a geometric object that has a given group as a symmetry group? And it turns out that this is actually one dimensional, so graphs are enough, which I personally find a little bit of a surprising result because kind of the natural objects groups tend to act on are more like polyhedra or something. So something higher dimensional. Um, but apparently, well, it's true that one dimension is actually enough, which I personally like a lot as a theorem. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I will talk to you next time.